Aristotle's poetics is basically the blueprint for storytelling. Like, really? It's crazy how this centuries-old text gave us almost everything that we need for a great story and a great character. Don't believe me? Boom! Watch this, bitch! Wait, actually, let me set it up first. It's important to note that there was never really a formal text written by Aristotle about the poetics. What we have is just his lecture notes. Also, when Aristotle is talking about poetry, he's talking about fiction writing in general, not just what we would consider poetry today. Brief backstory. Plato, Aristotle's teacher, hated poetry because it used emotion to convince people of something rather than logic. He also felt that life is an imitation of reality's true form and fiction is an imitation of life. Therefore, fiction is an imitation of an imitation which dilutes Lutes reality even further. He felt that it had absolutely no representation of truth. Now, Aristotle, on the other hand, being a rebellious student, saw it completely different. He saw fiction as a generalization of life, believing that a well-written character can be empathized with by everyone. Because of this, Aristotle thought that it was even closer to the truth because it was a shared reality amongst everyone. Basically, Aristotle felt that fiction studied the truth of human nature and human emotion. He argued that a character should not be 100% good or bad, but more similar to the audience who can empathize further when they're flawed. He also feels that a character should be consistent, but also said that a character can be consistently inconsistent, as long as it's consistent. Now, to wrap up this brief little backstory, what we know as the poetics is mainly speaking about drama. It is believed that Aristotle did the exact same thing about comedy, but unfortunately, that text is lost to the sands of time. <clears throat> now, where was I? Oh yeah, watch this, bitch! Okay, one of the main elements of the poetics is the tragic hero. Aristotle believed that a tragedy must have a protagonist, AKA the tragic hero, who is generally virtuous, but flawed in a way that may lead to his or her downfall. In modern cinema, this can be seen in characters like Anakin Skywalker. Anakin is talented and initially well-intentioned, but ultimately brought down by his fear of loss and subsequent turn to the dark side. In Aristotle's view, the tragic hero is a character of noble stature who has greatness, yet is not perfect. The hero's downfall is partially their own fault due to what is known as the tragic flaw. We'll get to the tragic flaw in a second. Let's stick to the tragic hero for now. But Star Wars is an easy one. George Lucas was intentionally copying myths and structures from the past to create this story. Another great example is Maximus from Gladiator. Maximus Decimus Meridius is a respected Roman general and admired by his men and the emperor. His loyalty to Rome and its true emperor becomes his downfall when he refuses to serve the corrupt Commodus. After being betrayed and losing his family, Family, Maximus's journey from general to gladiator is marked by a quest full of vengeance, ultimately leading to his death. Maximus's story embodies the tragic hero's journey with noble qualities leading to his personal tragedy through external circumstances and internal conflict. And your wife. Another great example is Michael Corleone from The Godfather. Michael begins the film as a promising morally upright man who is a war hero and the youngest son of Vito Corleone, a notorious mob boss. His deep sense of family, not to mention his father getting shot, pulls him into the mafia world, which corrupts his morals and ambitions. Michael's ascent into power within the mafia leads to his personal isolation, the loss of his family, and spiritual desolation. This is classic Aristotle. His loyalty to his family transforms his life's potential leading to his downfall, which is profoundly personal and impactful. And then you have a character like Walter White. Walt is a highly skilled chemist slash high school teacher. His pride as well as his newfound thrill of crime lead him to transform from a sympathetic character to a ruthless drug lord. Walt's criminal life escalates with his success, leading to multiple personal losses and ultimately his demise. Walt's journey shows righteous intentions that are eventually corrupt, leading to his downfall and his loss of his family. These are perfect example of Aristotle's tragic hero where no qualities are undermined by a tragic flaw leading to the hero's downfall. Now, side note, Aristotle being of his time saw the tragic hero as a noble person, meaning a person of wealth in the time. Nobility wasn't only a characteristic, but a social class. The nobility aspect in that sense doesn't always apply to today's storytelling. However, the tragic hero often does. But if you really wanna look at it from a nobility standpoint, you have to reverse the antagonist and the protagonist. For instance, looking at the original Star Wars films, Darth Vader fits that build perfectly, but the tragic hero fits with today's storytelling. Moving on. You can't talk about the tragic heroes without talking about their tragic flaws. For instance, in The Dark Knight, Harvey Dent's tragic flaw is his obsession with justice, which eventually twists into an obsession of what he perceives as fairness. No, no, that's not a protagonist. Shut up.
M300, King Leonidas oh, exhibits cool. tremendous courage and skill as he Gee, leads his 300 Spartans the against the massive Persian army. His hubris, come. however, lies in his overconfidence and his underestimation of the enemy's capabilities, True. along with a refusal to retreat or surrender which ultimately leads to the Spartans annihilation. Leonidas's pride and determination eventually leads to him and his army's downfall. So his tragic flaw would be hubris. The Great Gatsby is another great example. Jay Gatsby's tragic flaw is obsession. More specifically, his obsession with Daisy Buchanan. His fixation blinds him to reality, leading him to engage in criminal activity to build his fortune, throwing lavish parties in the hopes that Daisy will one day return to him. His inability to let go of his idealized version of Daisy and the past ultimately leads to his tragic death. You also have Howard Ratner from Uncut Gems. His tragic flaw is greed. Howard Ratner is a New York City jeweler constantly looking for his next big score. His compulsion to take higher risks along with his incessant greed drive him to make a series of high stakes bets that put him and his family in danger. Despite numerous opportunities to settle down and secure a profitable outcome, his flaws push him deeper into chaos accumulating in his tragic end. Every tragic character needs a tragic flaw. Now, moving on from the tragic character and the tragic flaw, we have more plot-driven things like Peripatia, or the reversal of fortune. Aristotle wrote about Peripatia as a sudden reversal of fortune from good to bad. A modern example of this could be Titanic, where Jack and Rose's romance goes from hopeful to tragic with the sinking of the ship, or Lester Burnham in American Beauty. Lester Burnham, a middle-aged, disenchanted suburban father, experienced a dramatic change in his life initially depicted as a man in deep existential crisis, confined by the social expectations of his lackluster job, Lester decides to make drastic changes, rejuvenating his life, including quitting his job, starting a fitness regimen, and rebelling against the social norms. However, just as he achieves happiness, he's shot and killed, positive to negative. Another great example is Andy Dufresne in The Shawshank Redemption. Andy Dufresne goes to prison did, for a crime he didn't commit positive to negative. Well, However, after years of suffering, his carefully planned escape eventually turns into happiness and freedom, negative to positive. Now, this one is way more important than you would think. If you really pay attention to every movie scene and every act and every sequence, they're all reversals of fortune. The small ones are scenes, the medium ones are acts, and the large ones are the story. These reversals of fortune can be positive to negative or negative to positive. The inciting incident in the first act is typically where the first reversal happens. So in John Wick, for instance, his dog being murdered is a reversal of fortunes from positive to negative. But by the end, him achieving his revenge is a reversal of fortunes from negative to positive. Seriously, pay attention to every scene, every sequence, every act, and every story, and you'll see these reversals of fortune. Now, moving on with the poetics, we have Anagnorisis, aka the moment of critical discovery. The hero has a moment of critical discovery, gaining more information, often too late to prevent what is about to happen. For example, in The Sixth Sense, Dr. Malcolm Crowe realizes that he's been dead throughout most of the movie, which dramatically changes his understanding of the events he's experienced. But it also changes the way the audience sees the story. Another great example is Fight Club. The narrator realizes that Tyler Durden, who he believes is a separate person, is actually himself. Again, it drastically shifts the character and the audience's perception of what has just happened. And that's really important. In these films, the moment of discovery not only affects the characters, but affects the audience in the way that we see the story. Now, I just used two films with plot twists to make it more obvious, but this happens even when there's not a plot twist in a film. For instance, in There Will Be Blood, when Daniel Plainview finds out the man who says he's his brother has been lying. This isn't just a moment of discovery, but a moment that solidifies who Daniel is going to be by the end of this story. Another good example is in Jerry Maguire, when Jerry Maguire realizes that he's actually in love with Dorothy. These are important moments that change the story, change the character, and change the audience. Moving on to catharsis. Now, catharsis is a release of built up emotion, usually happening towards the end of the film. In Schindler's List, the audience experiences catharsis when Oscar Schindler breaks down because he couldn't save more Jews. Even though he saved a thousand lives, the fact that he breaks down and he couldn't save more has a profound emotional effect on the audience. The viewer experiences both a deep sense of pity for Oscar Schindler's regret and for the immense loss of the Holocaust, not to mention the fear of human cruelty. 
In the Green Mile, the execution of John Coffey, a gentle giant with supernatural healing abilities who is falsely accused and convicted of murder, serves as the film's cathartic climax. His final moments combined with his earlier expression of weariness from the cruelty of the world bring the audience to an emotional peak and release. Throughout a story, our emotions are building towards something. A catharsis can be a big release or a small release, but a release of those emotions typically happens towards the end of the film. Now, further in the poetics, you have mimesis. Aristotle believed that art should imitate life, not in a literal sense, but in an imitation of emotional behavior. The best movies and the best stories imitate our lives. And I can hear some of you right now, Star Wars doesn't imitate your life. Shut the fuck up. Shut up. Imitation of life is not an imitation of the things that we do necessarily, but the imitation of our emotions. All great art, and more specifically, all great stories, imitate our emotional connection. That's the only way the audience can feel what's on screen. I don't know why I'm doing this with my hands, honestly. That was weird. The last thing I wanna talk about is the deus ex machina, which translates to the god of machines. It's when something affects the story, typically getting the protagonist out of a sticky situation that had absolutely nothing to do with what was going on before. It literally comes out of nowhere and saves the day. He felt that the resolution of a story should rise naturally from the actions of the characters, not from external forces. A good example the of the deus ex machina the is in War of the Worlds, down, when the aliens die from infection because they're not used to the Earth's microbial life. Another good example is from the Lord of the Rings Return of the King, when the eagles, which have appeared throughout the series, come and save Frodo and Sam just as they're about to succumb to Mount Doom's eruption and provided a quick resolution to their peril. A humorous example is in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. The abrupt modern day police arriving to arrest the character stopping the medieval quest ends the narrative instantly. This serves as a comedic and absurd twist, breaking the fourth wall and abruptly ending the quests for the Holy Grail without a resolution within the story's medieval setting. Now I use this as an example because it works and it also kind of works in Lord of the Rings too. So that's going to show you that all story structures, all narrative structures, all character structures are simply generalizations that have worked in the past. They should be used because they have worked in the past, but that doesn't mean that they're the only things that can work. Aristotle's principles of drama, although formulated 2300 years ago, are still foundational elements of storytelling today. And if you are any form of a storyteller, use these things to enhance your stories because they've worked in the past. Figure out what can work for your story and use it to make it better. Just a suggestion.